Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Satoshi from Ladies in Bitcoin and the MIT Bitcoin uh, Planning Expo. We are joined today with the amazing Elizabeth Stark, CEO of Lightning Labs. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'm so glad that you were able to make it here today, uh, given all the internet connection issues and all that. The thunderstorm. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So apologies in advance if I cut out. I'm currently tethering on 5G, but it's working for now. So of course the internet never works when you need it to. Uh, welcome to being in technology. But uh, it's awesome to see folks in the audience. Uh, greetings from New York City. I'm excited to come back to MIT soon and hang out with everyone. Great. Yeah, let's get started. Uh, so today we're going to be obviously talking about the Lightning Network. So why don't we get introduced to, you know, what exactly the Lightning Network is and why it was created and uh, perhaps, you know, talking a little bit about why people should be using Lightning versus other chains where we know that they've attempted to solve the uh, you know, efficiency and the high transaction fee issues that might come with using uh, the Bitcoin native chain. Uh, so first, I'm curious, like how many people in the audience have actually used Lightning, like show of hands? I, I can see a few. All right. Some folks in the room. Uh, yeah. So basically, if you look to the genesis of Bitcoin, you know, back in 2009, right, um, the genesis block of Bitcoin, uh, we started off with Bitcoin as the asset and the layer one. And Bitcoin intentionally made a number of trade-offs. And, and by the way, Satoshi was quite intentional in doing it. You had, um, you know, today you can do about five to 10 transactions per second. You know, you have a four megabyte virtual, sorry, four V byte block size and uh, with seg width that was increased from the one uh, standard. Um, so you can do not that many transactions per second. No, again, this is intentional. You have the 10 minute block time that was chosen, chosen intentionally in terms of propagation of blocks to avoid uh, things like orphans or blocks that were mined but aren't able to propagate and be used, and then you have the fee market. And the idea is Bitcoin fees are there to incentivize miners to keep on mining, especially as the block reward goes down. As we know, every four years, you actually have you know, the halving of the Bitcoin block reward and those rewards and the fees incentivize mining. So that is all to say that at the end of the day, um, Satoshi prioritized decentralization as well as the community that has built it you know, since 2009. And as a result, you have stability and security, but you do not have, say, a global database, database that is highly centralized, like maybe a number of other solutions that are out there. And the idea really, and this originates from the early days of Bitcoin and the number of developers, including you know, early pioneers, was to build a layered architecture, you know, build layers on top of Bitcoin. So if you look at the history of the internet, I used to teach about the intersection of uh, technology, law, and, and things like, you know, history of the internet and how it evolved, the internet equally had a layered architecture where you had a TCP IP, you know, you also had the, the base uh, hardware layers below that. And then you had protocols like HTTP, um, you know, IRC, a number of other ones, even something like a Bitcoin that's operating on top of it. And that was intentional because at the base layer, you wanted a degree of simplicity. You didn't want to put all the complexity and all the applications there. Um, this was a design choice on behalf of those that created the internet in the first place. And it was also a design choice on behalf of Satoshi and the Bitcoin developer community. So the way that I think about it is complexity is the enemy of security. Bitcoin intentionally does not have say Turing completeness. It, uh, there were opcodes that were removed in the early days by Satoshi in order to not allow for a great attack service, because of course, the more of an attack service you have, well, the more bugs you can have. And we've seen that pan out in a variety of other solutions that are out there today. So with Lightning, the idea is to have this layer two on top of Bitcoin, enabling instant high volume transactions with low fees, where you have local consensus amongst participants, as opposed to the global consensus on the base layer of Bitcoin, where all participants agree. I'm sure folks here are familiar with you know, the concept of running a full node. I'm sure a number of people here in the audience are running Bitcoin nodes. So you have, you know, according to some estimates, 50,000 or more folks running nodes on the network that are all agreeing and in consensus. Now enter Lightning, where all the participants don't have to agree, they establish local consensus. They actually use the base layer of Bitcoin in order to etch the transactions into the blockchain to get onto Lightning using a two out of two multi-signature transaction. And then once participants go onto Lightning, they go on chain first, 
they can transact between each other. But the key element here, and I like to think of it as like payments as packets, much like how packets travel through the internet. You have a series of nodes and they're connected to each other via these what we call channels. You can think of channels as like tubes of money, we like to call it, where you send and receive money. And if I'm connected to Sarah and Sarah is connected to say Jeremy, who's connected to Ashana, who's connected to Autumn, I can actually route through all those participants to get to the end destination. And then of course, those people are connected to people who are connected to people. So with only a series of channels where you're connected, you can reach effectively the entire network in order to do so. So it draws from principles of the internet as well in terms of the ability to connect over networks. But you're able to get hundreds of thousands of transactions per second in theory, you know, instant transactions, extremely low fees because you're not transacting in the base layer, using the base layer as a security mechanism. And by the way, importantly, all Lightning transactions on Bitcoin are secured by the underlying Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and Bitcoin is the most secure blockchain, has the most hash power backing it up, has the most users, has the most liquidity. So really what we're seeing is the ability to use the stability and security of the base Bitcoin layer, and then the instant high volume low fee transaction of layer two. And then of course, and we'll get to this, that makes it much easier to build upon Bitcoin in terms of applications, because you can do a lot of things and you can have you know, hundreds of thousands of instant transactions when you're sending say a Satoshi, which is less than 4 hundredths of a US cent today, uh, instantly globally around the world. There's a lot so there. <laughs> Yeah. So you spoke on um, how you know we open channels with each other, and theoretically, you would be able to essentially reach the entire network if we have enough people on those channels. Um, and so, how does uh, can you speak a little bit to how this network effect of um, you know users like number of users go up in Lightning, um, and especially around like you know adding to Lightning's liquidity relates to the number of people go up when it comes to Bitcoin adoption as a whole. Yeah, so uh, I like to uh, meme and counter meme <laughs> as one does sometimes on the internet. And basically at the beginning of 2020 and even end of, oh, sorry, beginning of 21 and end of 2020, a lot of people in the Bitcoin community were very much about number go up. There was a lot of discussion about the price of Bitcoin. And I kind of had a little bit of a life crisis to be honest, because I thought if I'm spending my life working with this incredible community, working on this open source software, you know, working on this company with this great team, just to buy a billionaire another yacht, like this is not what I deeply care about in my life, right? I care about empowering people with this technology. I care about bringing it to you know, the masses. So instead of the idea just that the price is going to keep going up and maybe that's concentrated in a few, I uh, created this concept and meme of number of people go up. And the idea being that the goal for this community broadly should be to provide access and bring technology to far more people. And of course, with Lightning as a scalability technology, um, it enables far more people to have access to Bitcoin as a whole. So the way that Lightning itself works is, the way that I think about it is you have amazing speed, scalability, and super low fees, but there's one constraint or trade-off, which is you have this liquidity aspect to Lightning. So on the base layer of Bitcoin, you know, for those, I'm sure most people here have sent a Bitcoin transaction, you just send to a Bitcoin address. There's no question of, do you have sufficient liquidity in order to do so? But because on Lightning, you have this channel-based architecture where each channel it has two participants and they connect to each other, you send and receive funds within that channel, you need money in the right direction. So it's a directional routing question. So again, if I'm going to send to you and you're going to send to Jeremy, you need routing in that direction, both, you know, me to you and then you to Jeremy. But let's say, you know, Jeremy's sending to Ashana and then Jeremy does not have, uh, sorry, Ashana does not have any, what we call inbound liquidity. She can't receive it. So the nature of Lightning is you both need money in order to send funds, which is obvious, like you're not going to send money if you don't have any, but you also need inbound liquidity or you need the ability to receive funds directionally. So on Lightning, you need money in the right place at the right time in order to send and receive. You actually need efficient capital allocation, which is one of the really interesting areas where you meld the way that I think of it is like financial systems and you know, economics, if you will, and then also incentive structures and then the technology that enables it and all the cool solutions that a variety of people in the community have been building. And you can actually think of it, there's a whole degree of optimization here. So Alex Bosworth, who's one of the developers at Lightning Labs, he uh, loves interacting with the community. If folks are on any of the Slacks or on Twitter, you might've seen his work. He uh, really likes to delve deep into this concept of liquidity and the idea around optimizing, around you know, 
things like circular routing with your channels, uh, using a variety of the liquidity solutions out there so that you can actually, you know, make money with your node. By the way, importantly, nodes charge fees, but they're just not nearly as high as you would um, have to pay for generally an on-chain transaction, especially when you have a low value transaction because you don't have the energy expenditure and um, you have a variety of nodes and there's in a way more competition because you can route through a variety of these nodes. But at a high level, um, the concept of liquidity on Lightning is one in which um, it can be optimized. There's a lot of automation that we're going to see. It's something today that is somewhat manual on behalf of, so we've got about 35,000 uh, node operators with um, publicly available nodes. And today they're actually opening and closing channels or using liquidity tools. We have some that we built our Lightning Labs, a variety of other people built some, um, and they're optimizing that. But in the future, this is a really interesting area for automation and you know a variety of AI type approaches because uh, there are ways in which people can just, you know, the software will do it for them. They'll automatically rebalance or know when to acquire new liquidity and so on and so forth, much like in the traditional financial world, you know, people that are say using banks and they're sending through transactions with correspondent banks, they don't know what's going on under the hood. I suspect with the liquidity question, we'll see a lot more there. And then one other important point, not all liquidity on the network is equal. So you could put funds in one node. And if that node doesn't have good connectivity, that's kind of, you know, in an island over here and that's not very useful. But if you have liquidity and capital in a node that is well connected, um, less capital could actually be far more useful and earn you far more routing fees and a yield as opposed to just useless capital over here. So um, the way that I think of it is you have a kind of a combination between a Moody's, which is in the financial world, a, a rating system um, for a variety of entities, and then Google PageRank coming from the tech side, where if a node has good uptime, good connectivity, that's actually going to be a, a good node to connect to on the network. And again, Alex Bosworth on our team had come up with this concept of a BOS score. Some other people are working on other means of scoring these nodes, but the idea is not all capital is equal. And you can actually optimize and you can actually figure out how to have good connectivity. And that makes you a better node overall, because if you're connected to a good node that's connected to a good node onward, that actually helps your node provide high quality liquidity for the network. Absolutely. Yeah. A node reputation is, you know, a, a big thing that I, I'm sure that anyone who is running a lightning node right now and opening channels um, is finding out that it is a, it's a process to have to, you know, rebalance and um, ensure that you, you know, uh, have a good node reputation so that people want to um, connect to your node and open channels with you and all that. And so uh, when speaking to, you know, the goal of number of people go up, as you said, um, one thing that I personally have as a concern, as I'm sure many people do, is uh, in regards to user experience when it comes to using Bitcoin and specifically using Lightning, especially because the Lightning Network allows us to make, you know, instant um, fearless, essentially fearless payments. And so when it comes to open source, you know, accessible software interfaces that people can use to interact with the Lightning Network or, um, you know, regarding uh, privacy practices where privacy might be really important for people who need to, to access, access Bitcoin in areas with either authoritarian governments or just uh, need privacy. Uh, and, you know, privacy for all of us is just a really good thing to keep in mind when it comes to transacting Bitcoin. You know, how does one, like, first of all, go about um, getting started in Lightning, whether it's uh, running a node or just, uh, you know, getting started with a uh, uh, creating invoices, and then two, how does one go about, you know, protecting their privacy when it comes to using um, Bitcoin, but especially Lightning, and maybe what is like being worked on to help improve privacy that's uh, specifically in Lightning? Can you guys hear me? Oh, yes. The internet gods are, are not being helpful. Okay, I'm back. Cool. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. And by the way, when we were going through our questions, I was joking with her. I was like, I could spend hours on all of these questions. I mean, I know we don't have that much time here. There's a lot yeah. there. Um, but first of all, I want to give a shout out um, to the incredible user communities that are out there, um, including Plebnet. Um, I know we heard about uh, 
D plus plus, who's one of the uh, people involved, Aaron Malone, another one. Um, there are these user communities that have emerged that are really only as of around 2020, um, where people guide each other. They have a number of Telegram channels. They're on, you know, a variety of online communities on Twitter, and they all help each other get up and running with nodes. They have a variety of guides. Um, they talk to other people in the community. They open channels with each other, and it, it's almost kind of like a social network where people are like, oh, I opened a channel to you, like, okay, cool, we're connected now. And um, I've met so many really amazing members of these communities. So for people looking to get started, um, you know, I would suggest checking out the user communities, the people that are involved in noted operations. There's a Slack for those that are running LND, which is the implementation that Lightning Labs works on. There are a variety of other, you know, discords and other chat, you know, IRC, Lalu, my co-founder, he likes to stay old school with IRC. Um, so the community is really um, welcoming. We're excited to get people involved. Um, and there are people there that are, are looking to help people get up and running with the node. But you know, if we're going to get this technology to billions, um, you know, we'll see. But in the future, running a node, say, that's always on with a stable internet connection. I mean, I can't even get a stable internet connection in New York City today, right? Um, may not be as feasible. And there are a number of great solutions out there including you know, mobile wallets, and that's huge for emerging markets, something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so for example, uh, folks may have heard of the Human Rights Foundation and a good friend of mine, Alex Gladstein, the chief strategy officer there, and he's gone really deep into Bitcoin and Lightning. Uh, he's prolific, he writes all the time. Check out his articles in Bitcoin Magazine. I just saw him a couple of days ago. And um, so non-custodial wallets here are key when it comes to mobile applications. Um, there are a number of them out there, um, including Moon, Breeze, Zeus, where you can also connect your node remotely and a variety of others. And when it comes to preserving privacy, well, if you don't have to identify yourself, say, to a government and you're able to hold your own keys and, and run that non-custodial wallet, that is really key. And especially if you're looking at authoritarian regimes or human rights activists. And this is something I'm going to be speaking um, in a couple of weeks at the Oslo Freedom Forum in Oslo. I'm really excited, my first time ever in Norway, um, talking to human rights activists about how technology can make a difference in what they're doing and how you know governments can't just take away their money. And one uh, really interesting uh, insight I had was uh, a couple months ago, I was at the Oslo Freedom Forum in Miami, it's not in Oslo, and met this incredible human rights activist named DJ Switch. Uh, she's one of the most famous DJs in all of Nigeria. She also recorded a crackdown on protesters by the military police in Nigeria. Where it was, I mean, people were shot and she was the one that live streamed it. And if she hadn't done so, people might not have even seen what had happened. And she had to flee the country. The government was trying to shut down her bank accounts. Um, she eventually made it to the US. And, I was excited to talk to her more about Bitcoin and how it can help people like her and other activists globally. And she you know, heard about it. She said, okay, that's really cool. Sounds interesting. But then a colleague of mine, uh, Jacob said, okay, get out your phone. And he said, okay, so, you know, install this app, install the Moon app. And he said, I, I just sent you $10. And she looked at her phone, right? And here, the phone, right? And she was like, what? And we were like, oh, we just sent you $10. And her jaw dropped and she could not believe it. And she said, oh my God. And we said, what? And she said, the government can't take this away from me. And that was a big lesson to me because sometimes you can tell people about something, but until they've actually experienced it, you know, and seen it with their own eyes, that's going to change their perception. What she realized was she said, I didn't even have to create a bank account. And we were like, yeah, that, that's Bitcoin and Lightning. You can just do this in a non-custodial manner on your phone and the government can't take that away from you. So there are many people like this globally. You know, Alex Gladstein talks about, you know, over a billion people living under authoritarian regimes. You look at issues like hyperinflation, capital controls, you know, a whole host of reasons why, you know, people are being harmed by the money of their government or governments going after freedom activists and people like her. So to me, you know, when we think about number of people go up, it's very much getting this technology in the hands of those that need it most and then building out. And I mean, I, there's a lot to discuss on the privacy front, um, you can do it, you know, you can write entire books on, on lightning and privacy, um, but I'm very excited about implementing Taproot and Schnorr on lightning. That means that on chain, you actually don't have 
channel opens that are distinguishable and then cooperative closes, but you can still see some data. But basically when it comes to like chain analysis type data on the base chain, you can't distinguish it as much. Um, there are variety of proposals from the community around recipient privacy, which is one of the key elements. We already use what we call onion routing in terms of the intermediate nodes. Um, so the community is working on a number of proposals um, and I'm excited to see that move forward because there's a lot of momentum there and this technology needs to ensure that people, especially you know, those that are in these authoritarian regimes cannot just be tracked down using the technology. Yeah, you know, for those who are living in authoritarian uh, regimes or countries where their local currencies are just extremely volatile, a lot of times people don't necessarily want to hold Bitcoin the currency, but would rather, um, you know, use U.S. denominated stable coins. And so stable coins, you know, used to originate on Bitcoin. Now they're no longer on Bitcoin, but perhaps uh, after the release of um, Taro, which Lightning Labs announced about a month ago, which uh, would allow, would enable stable coins on Lightning. You know, how do you see that as uh, tying into the expanded utilization of Bitcoin as this base blockchain layer rather than as a unit of account? And as well as speaking a little bit to how Bitcoin can be used further as a reserve for interoperability rather than, um, you know, for swapping assets and swapping between stable coins and onboarding to Bitcoin and fiat rails and all of that, rather than uh, utilizing Bitcoin as, you know, the currency. Yeah. So when you think about, you know, the concept of a currency, you have store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. And then actually when I was uh, speaking with Ashan and Autumn in Miami, they also mentioned the, the global um, reserve aspect, which I thought was really cool and interesting. But so you had Bitcoin, the asset emerge in 2009, right? That was like just third January, 2009, there was Bitcoin, the asset, you know, people were sending and receiving it and you had people, you know, buying and holding Bitcoin. That was what number go up was about, right? And then, you know, Bitcoin is a monetary network. Of course you could send and receive on the base layer, but if you want to onboard all of these people, you know, Bitcoin maintaining its decentralization intentionally uh, and by the way, I will note that a number of other chains that are out there go down for you know nine hours or 17 hours at a time. And Bitcoin has had 100% uptime for the last nine years. There were two very early incidents, but at, as a whole, it has 99.98, you know, et cetera, et cetera, percent uptime. You know, Bitcoin doesn't go down. Lightning does not go down. By the way, you have 35,000 plus nodes and one node can go down, but the entire network is not going to go down like that. So that's one key difference. Um, but anyway, so, you have Bitcoin the asset and then Bitcoin the monetary network, which I see really came to fruition uh, with the development of Lightning, you know, the initial proposal, the testnet versions. And then we saw uh, around 2018, uh, Lightning starting to be used on mainnet with real Bitcoin. And the ability to send this globally, to have the instant high volume transactions uh, with low fees, to be able to build all these really cool applications, everything from gaming, um, to trading, to streaming Satoshi's creator economy, to literally feeding chickens that Poyo feed is still around. If you wanna feed some chickens with lightning, check it out. Um, all these cool use cases that may not have been previously possible. Um, so we saw that people are using Bitcoin for this use case, but again, Bitcoin can be volatile. You know, it trades in real time. Um, there sometimes it's like, why did Bitcoin just go down? Like we don't always even know why, right? And there's demand for stable assets, but using Bitcoin as a monetary network. So um, Lalu, um, my co-founder, had been looking at Taproot, the upgrade to Bitcoin, which activated uh, this past November. And we'd, all, we'd always been really interested in you know, what we call a multi-asset lightning network. How do we bring other assets to the network, but make them transact via Bitcoin and through Bitcoin? And basically came up with this proposal, uh, drawing, you know, looking at what else people had done in the past and seeing, okay, how can we actually make use of Taproot for this using specifically the tree structure of Taproot to embed arbitrary asset metadata in the base layer of Bitcoin and then move those assets into Lightning. And by the way, um, it's quite cool. I realized once uh, I came up with the name, in fact, my friend came up with the name Taro. I told him, I was telling him about Taproot and he was like, wait, Taro? And I said, wait, that's a cool name. Uh, did you know Nigeria is the number one exporter of taro? And um, my co-founder Lalo is Nigerian American, which I thought was cool. Also very popular in Venezuela, um, Latin America, Southeast Asia, all these really cool places where people are using lightning today, right? El Salvador, we see a lot in Southeast Asia these days. So taro is a protocol um, that we're putting out to the community. So we've 
Uh, Lalo released a series of BIPs. Now we got a lot of really great feedback already from the developer community. You know, this is Bitcoin. These are open you know, proposals. And the idea is that you can use this protocol to issue assets on the base layer of Bitcoin and then move them into layer two into lightning channels. And this uses Taproot, you know, Schnorr signatures and the like. Now, importantly, the way that Taro works on the Lightning Network is as an overlay network. It's not a separate, you know, Taro network. Um, it actually makes use of the existing Lightning Network. And much like the principles of the internet, it actually pushes the assets to the edges of the network. And so one really cool thing about Taro is you could have, you know, Alice, Bob, Carol, Dave, Aaron. And Alice and Aaron are reading like a, a UAD. But the intermediate nodes are actually routing Bitcoin in between. So not only does Taro use Bitcoin as a monetary network, stable coin, to issue assets, but we wouldn't issue the assets. Other people use the infrastructure and the technology to issue the assets. But so you're using this, but what's really cool is these intermediate nodes on Lightning, they're actually just sending and receiving Bitcoin and they're routing Bitcoin. And then at the edges, you have the dollar. So you could have peso, yen, you know, pound, um, euro, et cetera. And all of these various assets and stable coins can be on the Lightning Network, but they're all routing through Bitcoin. So they don't need separate liquidity in each individual asset. Bitcoin becomes this like central connecting point to route all these other um, assets. And then of course there is a conversion that occurs dollar Bitcoin back to dollar, but it's all atomic within the path. So these nodes actually charge a small fee in order to do that quick conversion, but it basically either arrives at its destination or goes back to sender. Um, so that I think is really interesting with regard to, again, another meme that I like to create, but the idea of Bitcoinizing the dollar and Bitcoinizing fiat. We hear of dollarized economies, El Salvador, which we, you know, made Bitcoin legal tenders using lightning. You can pay at Starbucks with lightning at El Salvador. They were a, a dollarized economy. They're also now a Bitcoinized economy. So the goal with this new protocol is to bring these assets to Bitcoin, to use the stability and security of the Bitcoin network and the instant high volume, low fee and global, importantly, nature of lightning to be able to send and receive you know, assets like dollars for very low fees. And when it comes to access globally, there are you know, cross-border payments, remittances. There are people around the world where you know, the fees of something like a visa, which is 3% plus now almost 60 cents, are you know, they're just not feasible. It's way too high for them, right? If you look at other chains, I was actually at an event and somebody was trying to send USDC on ETH and the chain fee was $8, right? Well, what if you want to send 50 cents or, or less or a couple of dollars? That's not tenable. But on Lightning, you're actually able to have very low fee transactions and open this up globally. And not to mention the idea, again, of this like the phone and the non-custodial wallet angle where people can send and receive. And by the way, shout out as well to the Human Rights Foundation because they have a number of bounties out there including one for people to build stable coin related technology for use in human rights use cases. It is really exciting to think about how someone in the future or globally, we could be using Bitcoin without even knowing that we're using Bitcoin. Um, That's something I, I've said quite a bit where the vast majority of users may not even know they're using it much like, I mean, we're tech geeks, so we know about TCP IP probably, but um, a lot of people don't know and they're just using the internet and then you're abstracting that complexity away from the end user, but they're still getting all the benefits of transacting through Bitcoin and using Bitcoin in the global decentralized nature and uncensorable nature. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us and giving us this, this very informative talk on Lightning, on Taro, stable coins, just the exciting developments uh, into Bitcoin and Lightning's future. I just want to end this fireside by um, asking you one last question, since we're speaking to a room full of innovators and bright young minds who you know, may want to build on Bitcoin or specifically Lightning and will be the future innovators of Bitcoin. Um, what advice can you give them and what resources can you point them to to get started in their journey and what would you personally like to see being worked on in the lightning ecosystem wow well first of all it is by no means late it's funny because i think everyone that got involved in bitcoin was like oh, i'm so late i'm so late and you're like actually it's really still so early i mean in talking to people about bitcoin it's almost shocking to me how few people even know that lightning exists the broader realm of things and they say things like bitcoin can never scale and people will never be able to use it for global transactions and i'm like ha 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 like who wants to tell them right so it's definitely not too late um inspired by folks we just heard from uh, ashana and autumn how they just 
came to, I met them at a New York City Bit Dev meetup. Um, so getting involved in the community. So for those that have meetups in their local communities, going to events like these, that's been an incredible source for me to meet the community. I met Lalu, my co-founder at the San Francisco uh, Bit Devs meetup in 2015. And I met so many friends throughout these communities. Um, if you're not in a place that has meetups, I mean, there are online communities, be it, you know, Slack, Discord, IRC, Telegram, et cetera. Um, if you're a coder, um, to check out any number of the open source projects that are out there, both in the Bitcoin and Lightning community. Um, a special shout out to Chain Code, who has been doing incredible work. I know we heard about Summer of Bitcoin. They have a number of residencies. We have people on our team at Lightning Labs that have participated in those and that are also mentoring with those. So there are a number of programs to get people started. Um, definitely don't feel like you're alone. You don't need to feel like you need to know everything at once. I mean, we're still learning every day. I mean, and it's, it's also one of these funny things where we'll ask like, oh, well, how long will it take to do like, you know, this build this new tarot protocol? And we're like, well, no one's ever done it, but you know, we're just, we're blazing the past. So um, I really love meeting with the community, uh, getting to know people. So my advice is um, check out the online resources, by the way, Mastering the Lightning Network. It's a book by Andreas Antonopoulos, Lalu uh, Osantikon and Renee Picard, who I know we were hearing from as well. And that's a great resource that's online in the GitHub repo. There's so many uh, types of, uh, you know, podcasts, documentation, books that are out there. If anything, there's like, there's so much information, but I would just not hesitate to get started. Don't feel like, oh, this isn't something that you know yet, because, you know, within like a short period of time, you're going to know way more than like virtually everyone else in the world. And then, yeah, get involved in the community, um, come to the meetups, contribute to mailing lists, contribute on chat. And also, you know, there are people that do all sorts of things. If you're not technical, there are so many people involved in podcasting and documentation and just like general advocacy. Um, if you are technical coding um, at the base layer, building apps. I mean, we have hundreds upon hundreds of apps today built on Lightning um, using the APIs in order to do so. I know there's a hackathon as well where Lightning is one of the tracks there. Um, so yeah, and then in, in terms of what I would like to see most, I mean, on Lightning, I, I want to see everyone. But what I would love to see is I want to see people building more solutions and more applications, you know, that are solving real problems for real people globally. And every day we talk to folks that are building internationally in places like, you know, Argentina or Vietnam or the Philippines. So I would encourage everyone to just get started, try it out, uh, build something, contribute in some way, because we are actually building the future of money and it's not going to look like the past and it's not going to be built by the same people as the past. And it's going to be far more open, accessible and going to pro provide far more from financial freedom than we've seen in the past. And that's what gets me up every day and inspires me. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I know that we are uh, just about out of time, but I would love, Gabriel, if we could take one or two questions. Hey, sorry, I don't think we have time here. I think we're gonna have to go to the next session. Sorry. No worries. I know. Yeah. <laughs> We got there only in a short period of time. Okay, well, um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, uh, DM at Starkness, uh, at Lightning for the Lightning Labs Twitter account, um, and uh, hope to see everyone there.